Good evening, St. Rest family and friends. How blessed of God we are to be back in Bible study tonight. We're continuing our series as we believe. We've been walking through the articles of faith, article by article. Tonight we're going to look at article number 13, Baptism in the Lord's Supper. Article 13, Baptism in the Lord's Supper. I will pray and then we'll dive into the lesson as we look at these ordinances of the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. God, our Father, we bless your name. We honor you for all that you are and all that you do. Thank you, God, for another day's journey. Thank you for your grace and mercy that is applied to our lives. Thank you for your word. In times like these, we are so grateful and so needful of hearing what you have to say to us. So many headlines have claimed our attention. So many headlines have brought us trauma, tragedy, and pain. But God, we are grateful that your word allows us to have help and hope in times of need. Grass withers, flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. So God, as we study your word tonight, we pray that you would show us those things you'd have us to see. Speak those things you'd have us to hear. Teach us what you'd have us to learn so we can be what you've called us to be. More importantly, do what you've called us to do. Lord, sit me down. Allow your word to go forth with accuracy and clarity that your people be edified and you be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we're looking at Article 13 tonight of our Articles of Faith in this series, As We Believe. And as we've tried to explain over the past few weeks, these Articles of Faith are confession or profession statements that explicitly explain what we believe in conjunction with our faith. So when we talk about baptism, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, when we talk about the fall of man, the way of salvation, and many of the other articles we've discussed, each statement provides an explanation on what we believe about those elements of our faith according to the Word of God. That's why when you look at these articles, each article begins the same way. We believe the scriptures teach. It reminds us that it's in the Word of God. We're not giving you what we think. We're not giving you what St. Rest said. We're not giving you what the Baptist Church said. These articles reflect what's in the Word of God. So when you see these articles, you will find biblical ties to them because they have biblical roots. They're in the Word of God. So let's look at Article 13. That article states, We believe, the Scriptures teach, that Christian baptism is the immersion in water of a believer into the name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost to show forth in a solemn and beautiful emblem our faith in the crucified, buried, and risen Savior with its effect in our death to sin and resurrection to a new life that it is the prerequisite to the privileges of a church relation and to the Lord's Supper in which the members of the church by the sacred use of bread and wine are to commemorate together the dying love of Christ preceded always by solemn self-examination. So as we look at this article, it gives us insight to the two ordinances of our church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is a reflection of our death to Christ. When you are baptized, it shows that you have been buried to self, buried to sin, and risen in Christ, that you have made the outward statement of an inward change, that you've decided to make Jesus your choice. So baptism is the reminder that we are alive in Christ, that we have buried our own selves to become alive in him and live for him. The Lord's Supper tells us and reminds us of Christ. It is the remembrance of Christ. Every time we come to the table, even as we're preparing now for another first Sunday, when we take the bread and wine, the juice, the cup, and the bread, it reminds us of the broken body and shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we come together, it's a chance for the church at large to lay aside our differences lay aside our cares, and focus on the reason why we are together as a church, because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So let's look at these two ordinances that are outlined in our article tonight. First of all, let's look at baptism. Let's look again at the first part of this article. We believe, the scriptures teach, that Christian baptism is the immersion in water of a believer into the name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost 
to show forth in a solemn and beautiful emblem our faith in the crucified, buried, and risen Savior. With its effect in our death to sin and resurrection to a new life, that it is prerequisite to the privilege of a church relation. So it talks about Christian baptism. The question first comes up, who established baptism? Who decided it was necessary for Christians to be baptized? Who established baptism? And when we read the word of God, we learn that Jesus Christ established the ordinance of baptism. Let's first go to Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19. Familiar passage, Matthew 28 and 19, where the Bible says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here, Jesus explicitly says that the efforts of the Great Commission involves us making disciples. There's one command in the Great Commission, make disciples. He tells us we make disciples by going, which means to go out into the lost and preach the gospel. And once we have converted them, he then says to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This idea of baptizing means to bring new converts into the faith. This is not about changing churches. It's not about swapping sheep or fishing in another man's river. This is about us going into the lost areas, those unsaved areas, and preaching the gospel to people and helping them convert into the faith. So when we baptize, we're not just recruiting church members. We are signifying that there are new members in the family of faith, in the kingdom of God. And here Jesus explicitly tells us that as you go, not only share the gospel, but once you've shared the gospel, baptize them and mark them as a new believer by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 28, but Jesus never asks us to do something that he's unwilling to do himself. So when it comes to baptism, not only did Jesus say it, Jesus did it as well. Let's look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Here is the account of the baptism of Jesus. Gospel is written by Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. The Bible says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So not only did Jesus say to baptize in Matthew 28, Jesus himself was baptized in Matthew chapter 3. And we see this conversation he has with John, where John says, Listen, I don't need to baptize you. It's better for you to baptize me. But Jesus responds by saying to John, it's fitting for us to do this so all righteousness be fulfilled. And once Jesus was immersed in water, once he was baptized in the water, you see God's seal of approval because two things happen. The Spirit of God descended on him like a dove and the voice of God cried out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So this lets us know that Christ established baptism by saying it and by doing it. And in doing so, God was pleased because Christ's baptism fulfilled righteousness. He made it right. So when you ask the question, who, who established baptism? Jesus Christ established baptism. So the next question that we get from this article is how is baptism executed? You'll notice in the article, it mentions this word immersion, immersion in water. That word in the original language in the Greek means to be buried. 
The reason why we believe as a Baptist faith of immersion in water, opposed to a sprinkling or just a drop of water, is because it represents the idea of being buried to sin and alive with Christ. Uh, we can look first at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Romans chapter 6. verses 3 and 4. Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. Notice what he says. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So Paul, in this section of his letter to the Romans, reminds them that we have been made dead to sin and alive to God. And he tells them that when you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death, that you were buried into death by means of baptism. So these verses reflect the reason why we believe in immersion because it is a symbolic view of what takes place when we have been spiritually baptized into Christ. We have crucified the flesh. We have buried our old man. We have been buried into sin, buried into death. And once we come up from the water, we're made alive with Christ, which spiritually reflects what takes place when we have been converted into the faith, that we've been made dead to sin and alive to Christ. So the reason why immersion is key to our belief system of baptism is because it reflects what symbolically takes place in our lives once we make Christ our savior. And when we look throughout the examples in scripture of the first baptisms we see in the New Testament, all of them speak to the idea of immersion. We saw it in Matthew chapter three where the Bible says when Jesus came up from the water, which means if he came up from water, doesn't mean that somebody sprinkled water on him or they just dipped a part of him. That means he was immersed in water. We also see this take place when the eunuch was baptized in Acts chapter 8. Let's turn there. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 39. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 39. The Bible says, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. This comes after Philip evangelizes to the Ethiopian eunuch. He's reading the book of Isaiah and not understanding what is in the text. So he sees Philip along the way and asks Philip, what does this mean? And Philip reads uh, the portion in Isaiah where he says, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before a shear, he was silent. So he opened not his mouth In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life? is taking away from the earth. Uh, he's reading the text in Isaiah 53, if I'm not mistaken, where we get the prophecy of both Christ as person and his purpose, that he came to die for our sins. And once Philip evangelizes to this eunuch, this eunuch asks, what must I do to be saved? He says, repent and be baptized. And they notice water is there. He says, what prevents me now from being baptized? So Philip and the eunuch go into the water and he is immersed in water because the Bible says he came up from the water. So when we look at the example of Jesus, when we look at the example of this Ethiopian eunuch, it gives us insight that the early practices of the church, the early practices in the New Testament was baptism by immersion. And this is key because if you read anything about Baptist history and Baptist heritage, it has been long debated on how we should baptize. There was a point where immersion was not accepted. There was a point where sprinkling is accepted in other denominations. And even to this day, 
you will find people having tense theological and historical debates on how baptism should be executed. The reason why we believe in our Baptist faith and immersion is because of what is mentioned in scripture about the symbolism of being dead to sin, alive to Christ, and the examples set before us show they were immersed in the water. So that's why we believe in immersion because the word of God gives us insight to both the practice and the principle behind immersion. So not only do you notice it's executed by immersion, but the article also says that we're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Many questions will ask, why do we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? First of all, Jesus said it. When you read Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, he says to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And the reason why we say that is so we understand that these individuals who are baptized are not baptized into the church. They're not baptized into church membership, but they're baptized into Christ, the triune God. You may be baptized at St. Rest, but you're not baptized into St. Rest. You may be baptized at a certain church, but you're not baptized into the church. You're baptized into Christ. And that language of being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit indicates what you believe as you're being baptized. And I fear too often we tie baptism to a location and not to a person, which means we tie our faith to a location and not a person. To where we'll say, well, I was baptized into St. Rest. No, you were baptized at St. Rest. But if you were baptized, you were baptized into Jesus Christ. And regardless of whether you're a member of St. Rest, Mount Canaan, Trinity, or whatever church, as long as you're baptized, you're a part of the Church of Christ. Regardless of what name is on the placard, you belong to the Church of Christ. So when we say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, it's a reminder that our faith and our profession of faith is tied into the person of Jesus Christ. We're not baptized into church membership. We're not baptized into a certain church. We're not baptized into a certain pastor or a certain person. Physically, we are baptized into Jesus Christ. So when we dip in the water, it's a reminder that we've been made dead to sin and alive to Christ. And when we're baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, it's a reminder of what you believe. You believe that Christ is part of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and Christ died for your sins and was risen for your justification. That's why when we baptize, we say to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And you set the record straight. It's not about church membership. It's about kingdom fellowship. Because at the end of the day, your baptism reflects your faith, not your church membership. And I know times now where we are uh, call for us to be in certain places where not only uh, church membership has changed, but how church membership looks has changed. Uh, there may be members in Dallas who are connected to us here at St. Rest in Shreveport, or there may be members in other parts of the country connected to us or vice versa to where virtual membership now says that, hey, I may be part of a church where I'm not locally affiliated. But as long as you're baptized, it doesn't matter where you are, you're baptized into the church of Christ. And that's why it's important for us to remember that because baptism doesn't reflect where you attend church. Baptism does not reflect who your pastor is. Baptism reflects your faith. So we've asked the question, who established baptism? We've asked the question, how is baptism executed? Last question this article presents is, what is baptism's effect? What is baptism's effect? What does it mean to be baptized or what happens when you become baptized? The article points to this idea of a beautiful emblem. This idea that baptism reflects an outward expression of an inward change. It's the coming out party of the believer where you make a public profession saying that I've decided to follow Jesus Christ. Now, I know some may ask, can you be saved without being baptized? And the answer is yes. Biblically speaking, we have record of individuals who have been redeemed and saved who have never gone into the water to be baptized. 
when we look at that thief on the cross in his dying moments, he asked the Lord, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom to which Jesus replies today, you'll be with me in paradise. Now notice it's never on record that he went to Sunday school. It's never on record. He went to a church service It's never on record. He was baptized, but we know he was in the presence of God because he asked the Lord to remember him to save him in his dying moments. So it is true. You can be saved without being baptized. But when you look at the example of the thief on the cross, time did not permit him to be baptized. I believe if he was exonerated from being on death row, after he got off of death row, he would have found some water and been baptized. So the question really becomes, yes, you can be saved without being baptized, but why not? If you have really decided to make Jesus your choice and time permits you to make that public profession, what hinders you from being baptized? If you know Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life and the savior of your soul, why not make that public profession? Why not make that public statement to say, this is my belief that I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. I believe that he died for my sins. He was buried and rose again that I may receive eternal salvation. If you really believe that, then baptism should be more of an exciting privilege than a burden because you are now uh, reflecting in this moment or the ceremony that I believe in Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior. But we also see, according to the article, that not only is it a beautiful emblem, it's also the privileges of a church relation. It let's us know that when we are marked for baptism or when we have uh, perform the ceremony or act of baptism, that we're now connected to a family of faith, a body of believers, the church of Christ. And we have fellowship with other members who have been baptized, who have made the profession of faith in Christ. It not only is the coming out party of the believer individually, but it's also the RSVP for a church reunion that when we come together, we are, as we mentioned last week, a community of baptized believers. You now have brothers, you now have sisters, you now have family members in the faith who believe like you believe. And when you make that step of baptism, you're not only saying that I believe in Christ, but you're also saying that I'm connected to a family of faith. And that's a great privilege to have in these times where you have a family that is marked by faith. Uh, my friend, Pastor H.B. Charles has said it before. We say that blood is thicker than water, but not when that water is baptism. When we are baptized into Jesus Christ, we are baptized into the greatest family ever. That when we step out of time into eternity, all of the familial ties we have here pale in comparison to the familial ties we'll have up there. We'll be connected to our brothers and sisters in Christ forever as a family of faith. And that's the effect of baptism. It's an emblem of change. It shows the outward expression of inward change, but it also invites us to experience the privilege of church relationship. We have a family that is bigger and better than any family we can experience on earth. So that's a look at baptism. Let's quickly look at the Lord's Supper. Here's the last part of the article. And to the Lord's Supper, in which the members of the church, by the sacred use of bread and wine, are to commemorate together the dying love of Christ, preceded always by self-examination. Here we can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 34. And I remember as a boy in church, before we took communion, you would have either one of the preachers or one of the deacons read this scripture to explain the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 34. Here, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Here, Paul explains both the symbol and and the principle with the Lord's Supper. He explicitly explains that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it is a reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. He gave his blood and his body for us to be saved. Now, there are two important factors of the Lord's Supper that we need to consider according to this text. First of all, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it is a moment of unity. It is a moment of unity. When you look at the previous verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul makes the statement in verses 17 and 18 that this church in Corinth, these Corinthians, had problems with getting along for fellowship. When you look at verses 17 and 18, he says, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. Here, they're having issues with divisions, dissension, and factions within the church when they come together for the fellowship. So he commends to them, as they're partaking of the Lord's Supper, this is a moment where the church can come together in unity and fellowship under the umbrella of remembering the broken body and shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the same is true for us now, that when we come to the table, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it is a moment of unity for us as a church. In all of my years, I have never seen a fight break out during the Lord's Supper. I've seen some fights break out about the Lord's Supper, whether we're going to cover the table or not cover the table, whether we're going to use real bread, real wine or juice and cracker, whether we're going to use the packages or somebody's going to prepare. I've heard all the fights about the Lord's Supper, but in the moment where we're together, I have never seen a fight during the Lord's Supper because it is a moment of unity. That's where we can come together without any dissension without any division without any argument we're not fussing about choir robes or what we should wear on usher annual day we're not fussing about the menu for church anniversary or anything else we're coming together as a family of faith united for one reason we have come to commemorate the broken body and shed blood of our lord and savior jesus christ we're not fighting about hymns we're not fighting about church fashion or anything else in those moments it is a solemn moment for us to band together to celebrate what Jesus Christ did for us. And every time we come to the table, that is a moment for us to stand in unity. Doesn't matter if you wear jeans or three-piece suit. It doesn't matter if you sing hymns or contemporary music. It doesn't matter if you give physically or give online. It doesn't matter any of the different things that may divide us. In that moment, all of the saints, all of the believers, rich or poor, black or white, young or old, Republican, Democrat, all of us can come together and say we are a family of faith who remembers the broken body and shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The table, the Lord's Supper, allows us to gather as a family united under one cause, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And that's enough for us to fellowship. And may we keep that in mind in days to come that we can put aside our petty differences and be more focused on the fellowship when we remember what brought us together for the fellowship. I believe if we focus more on Christ and his sacrifice, we wouldn't be worried about the petty things that can cause us to be divided in fellowship. When we think about Jesus 
instead of thinking about budgets and everything else under the sun, we might be more inclined to fellowship together. And that's what happens when we come to the table. We have a moment of unity. But also more than that, we have a moment of understanding. Paul commends the church that when you come to the table, you remember as you eat the bread, it's his body that was broken for you. When you take the cup, it was his blood that was shed for you. And the Bible says as often as you do it, as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we come to the table, we need to have that moment of understanding that Jesus died for us. It should have been us and it could have been us to pay for our own sins. But because of the selfless act at Calvary, Jesus Christ paid for every sin we ever committed. So when we come to the Lord's table, we do so solemnly and joyfully knowing he made the sacrifice for us. That when we take of the elements of communion, we are proclaiming that Jesus died for our sins, that we have the right to the tree of life. And that should be the understanding every time we come. It should not be about, as Paul mentions, a moment for you to have a snack because you're hungry. Because the Bible says, if any man hungers in the moment of the Lord's Supper, let him eat at home. Because you dare not take the Lord's Supper in vain or take it unworthily or in an unworthy manner because the Bible says you bring judgment upon yourself. In these moments, it's not about the juice and crackers. In these moments, it's not about the bread and wine, not about how it tastes. It's about you understanding what this moment represents. Jesus shed his blood for you so you could be saved. That's why in days of old we were seeing, let's break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, here's how I should act. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. So as we prepare for the table this Sunday, I pray that we will have a moment of self-examination. Pray for the uh, forgiveness of sins if you committed. Pray that you have an understanding of what happens at the table. But also pray for a moment of unity that as a church, wherever you're attending church, if you're partaking of the Lord's Supper, you know that the church stands united proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. God, our Father, we bless you tonight for this great privilege of Bible study and thank you for breaking down to us the importance of baptism in the Lord's Supper. God, I pray that we would take these ordinances of the church seriously, that we would not only participate in them, but understand the principles behind them, that these two ordinances speak of our relationship to you, that you died for us, that we could live for you. God, as we're baptized, we're made dead to sin and alive to Christ. And as we are partaking of the Lord's Supper, we remember your broken body and shed blood, that we celebrate the great sacrifice you made for us. Pray, God, that this lesson encourages those it needs to encourage. It convicts those it needs to convict. Let your word accomplish that which you please. And we'll tell you thank you for what comes from the fruit of this time of labor in your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We thank God for your presence tonight and we pray something was said in this lesson that will bless you along your journey of faith. If you've been blessed by this lesson or blessed by the ministry of St. Rest, we invite you to give as God lays on your heart to do so. Here at St. Rest, we have several methods by which you can give. You can give physically to our campus. You can also give electronically through Givelify, PayPal, Zelle, Cash App, and Google Pay. Several methods of giving but the same mentality. God loves a cheerful giver, and I'm a living witness who keeps on saying it. You can't beat God giving, no matter how hard you try, because the more you give, the more God will give to you. So if you feel led to give tonight, we encourage you to do so. And please know, we'll be good stewards of how God blesses us through your contributions. And to those who continually contribute to the life of our church, we thank you, thank you, thank you. You are a blessing to St. Rest by how you're investing in the ministry work we're doing here for the kingdom of God. As we come to a time of close, several prayer requests demand our attention. Let's continue to keep in prayer the family of Sister Geraldine Anderson, who made her transition. Uh, let's pray for her family, especially Sister Cheryl Anderson Robinson. Uh, those funeral arrangements are pending, so let's keep the family lifted in prayer. We also want to pray for uh, Sister Bertha Small, Sister Yvonne Small as well. We want to pray for Sister Gladys Moore. We are praying for Brother uh, Johnny Williamson. We are praying for the family of Dennis Ray Jones as they just laid him to rest recently. 
We're also praying for the Caesar family, Sister Jackie Smith, uh, Sister Higgins, and others. Let's also keep uh, the city of Uvalde, Texas lifted in prayer, as well as Buffalo, uh, New York. You've heard the tragedy in both places with these mass shootings that are taking place. Uh, we're yet praying for those communities, those families that are impacted. And we're also praying for change in our nation to where it does not appear that we're one nation under guns, but we're one nation under God. Uh, something needs to be done about our gun issues in this country. So we are praying not only for the well-being of those families, but that God uh, have mercy on us through Congress and through our political system that we find a better way to handle these moments because we've had one mass shooting too many and we need God to intervene in those spaces. We also want to pray with you. Comment and let us know how we can walk with you in prayer. We believe in the power of prayer because God is able. So whatever your prayer request may need, may be, please comment and let us know so we can walk with you in prayer. God, our Father, we bless your name for tonight. We thank you for this moment of Bible study. We thank you for this privilege of prayer. You've heard the names mentioned. God, we thank you for the life and legacy of Sister Geraldine Anderson. We pray for her family now as they grieve her transition and they prepare for her home going. Be with that family. Give them comfort and strength. We also pray the same for the family of Brother Dennis Ray Jones. Thank you for his life. Be with his family as they deal with grief and bereavement. Deal with others who have been dealing with death of loved ones. Be with those who are dealing with sickness. And God, have mercy on us as a church. Continue to bind us together in love and fellowship. And God, we pray for those who are watching that you would help them in those spaces where they need you the most. Provide their needs. Ease their pains. Heal their bodies bring peace to their minds. Whatever they stand in need of God, meet their needs according to your will. We thank you in advance for what shall take place for us trusting in you for not only hearing our prayers but answering our prayers. For we believe it done by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.